glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Oh, you're good. You're worthy, Jesus. You're worthy. Oh, if the glory is yours. I love you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. He's always worthy of the glory. In the good times, I'm going to praise him. In the bad times, I'm still going to praise him. He is a worthy God, a good God. He's faithful, and he's true, and he's never failed me yet. He never will. And I want to be somebody that's faithful to him, and there's always one that worships him and loves him. God's good all the time. And all the time, he's a good God, too. My text today is found in James chapter 2. I'm going to read verses 19 through 23. I'm actually probably going to, my longer text would be verses 14 through 26, but we'll kind of wrap into that, and you know I'm going to throw a, well today it's definitely going to be a Bible study, we'll have a lot of verses, but God's good. I just won't keep you standing quite as long for the text. James chapter 2, verse 19. James said, Thou believest that there is one God. Anybody here believe there's one God? He said, You do well. Then he said, The devils also believe. Even the devils believe. And they believe so much that they tremble. But he went on to say, after making that statement, but wilt thou know, O vain man, or empty-headed man, that faith without works is dead? And then he gives us an example. He says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect and the scripture was fulfilled which saith abraham believed god and it was imputed unto him for righteousness and he was called the friend of god you know verse 22 says that by works was faith made perfect and so tonight i want to it's a bible study on the perfecting of faith the perfecting of faith and we pray, Jesus, I love you tonight. And I thank you for your word. I thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you for your mercy, for your grace, for your goodness, God, to us. You are an ever faithful God, and you are a mighty God. And I believe, God, today that you are forever, and your word is forever established, and that you change not. And I pray, God, today that you would anoint, Lord, your word. God, help it to be a strength to us. Let there be understanding by it. God, let there be a stability in our lives because of your word, I pray. Let it be that anchor in our lives. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. Thank you for being here on a Wednesday when the weather is so nice and you could be so somewhere else. But I am glad you're here. There isn't any place I'd rather be than in the house of God. This is important for today. This is important for eternity. I believe that we're living in the last days, and there's a lot of distractions, and there's a lot of things going on. And I also believe it's never been easy to live the apostolic faith. I mean, there's always been those that question what we believe and how we live and why we believe differently. I'm looking at some, some of you. You know what I'm talking about. It's, it's, it's never been, I mean, other Christians say, why are you doing this and we do that? And, you know, going back to the 70s, there's been an ecumenical push to encourage all Christians to come together on core doctrine that everyone can embrace and agree on and to no longer insist upon those beliefs that other denominations may look at a little bit differently. It's been a push and some of our young people, it's been your entire lifetime, but I can remember when the Baptists insisted that baptism was essential for salvation. Anybody else remember that? You know what they believe now? It's a good thing to do, but it's not necessarily essential. 
I remember when the assembly of God believed just like we do that the receiving the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues was necessary to be saved. I remember that. But now they say it's a gift of the spirit, but it's not required for salvation. There was a time when this goes back maybe a little bit further, but the Methodist and a lot of mainstream denominations, they taught and they lived a life that was a holy life and modesty of dress and the way that they comported themselves was such that they believed that without holiness you weren't going to make it to heaven and now some of those same organizations will look at you and tell you we don't have to do that that's legalism and that's works the bible hasn't changed jesus christ is the same yesterday today and forever man can change but God is consistent. His word is consistent. What it takes to get to heaven hasn't changed. The plan of salvation hasn't changed. The pressure and the expectation upon us is different. There's always been the pressure. But I think now we feel like maybe it seems like we're one of the last few holding out on so many things that before there were at least others that seemed to agree with us on those things. There are many ways that as the apostolic church today, our, our beliefs are challenged. I mean, sometimes it's those little comments. It's those innuendos, those little digs, you know, those the Bible calls them the fiery darts of the wicked that try to wear down your soul. Uh, you know, though, you really don't have to do that to be saved. Anybody hear that? Or we're all going to heaven. It's just a matter of whether you want to go the hard way or the easy way. And God's a loving God, and he's a merciful God, and he's a gracious God. And all it really is doing is just trying to kind of wear at your faith a little bit and kind of make you even second guess. And, you know, if you start to say, if, if I'm believing this way and everyone else is believing that way, you know, we live in a democracy, and part of our mentality is everybody's got you know, the majority surely isn't going to get it all wrong. I think those of us who look at the political landscape can realize the majority isn't necessary. I mean, it's to gauge correctness by. People say things like, I used to do that, but legalism, that, that's not necessary anymore. And in addition to that, you're going to walk into some people, and they're going to want to challenge you on what you believe. And they're going to open their Bible, and they're going to use scriptures to prove what they believe is truth anymore. And Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16, he, he said, as also in his epistles, he's referring to Paul, he said, speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. He's saying they're going to twist, they're going to pervert or change the meaning of scriptures in order to prove points that aren't necessarily God intended when that scripture was written and we find that it's happening today the Bible talks about wolves in sheep's clothing I also believe that there are many 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 people that honestly believe and they just don't understand the full truth and so we can become defensive but I think that what we really need to do is we need to understand I want to be one uh, that is always ready to give an answer of the hope that lies within me and understand that this is something that it's my salvation that I want to be able to share it with somebody else and I want to be firm in what I believe but I want to be able to reach and speak with love that's what I want to do tonight there isn't anything in my heart but just love for each and every one of you and for anybody that may hear this message but I do strongly believe everything that I'm going to say tonight I want to go to heaven I want to take as many people with me as possible I've said it so many times but that is the goal and that is the purpose and the entire aim of my life. I have no other ambition. To me, that's success. Make heaven and influence somebody else to get there too. Marjorie went too long ago. We were shouting about a new birth experience. And I'm still thankful for that. And for each one of you, I'm thankful that we can be in this walk to heaven together. And You know, one of the main areas where we differ as apostolics, I consider us to be apostolic. That means that we aren't taking anything as far as from a Catholic background or from even a Protestant background. 
A lot of times someone will talk to you and they say, so which branch of, Pro of Protestant Reformation are you from? And I've always struggled with that because I believe that we should go back clear to the book of Acts and we aren't going to take any misconstrued partial corrections of a church that was messed up to begin with. And so I, I've, when I talk about the apostolic church, that's really what I believe that we are and that we should be. I think that we should found everything that we have on this, not on traditions, not on teachings of man, but on the word of God. And, you know, the Catholic world is heavenly work based. If you know anything about the Catholics, they're, it's always they're going to Mass and they're doing this confession and they're, they're doing a hundred Hail, Hail Marys or they're doing things in order to make sure that they can get to heaven. And then you have the Protestant response that through Martin Luther had a reaction to that and they rejected all that teaching. And they began to teach a doctrine and it was about 500 years ago that was on the opposite end of that spectrum and it's, for them, they were saying there's no works, there's no action of any kind or even allowed as far as your salvation. So you have one extreme to the other extreme. Martin Luther had a statement. It was almost his mantra. You may have heard it, by grace alone, through faith alone. Has anybody heard that? Yeah. By grace alone, through faith alone. That was a, an original with Martin Luther. That is, that is not biblical. That is an unbiblical statement. But even if you hadn't heard the statement, you know some people that have lived with that philosophy, by grace alone, through faith alone. And I want to study that a little bit today. And as apostolics, we find that we're striving to follow this biblical understanding, and we're getting pulled in both directions. Some people are looking at us crazy from one side to another side. And the main reason for this is because our definition of faith, I want to say that again, our definition of faith they say by grace alone, through faith alone, but our definition of faith is different than their definition of faith. If you talk to someone from this Protestant reform, re reformist Martin Luther and they begin to talk to you about scriptures, they're going to a lot of times come to you with Romans chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. And it's where Paul wrote and he says, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace but of debt. Paul's saying if, if you're doing works, then you should get paid for that. So therefore, that's not grace. And he goes on in the next verse to say, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. If you believe in God, that's their definition of faith. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. His faith is counted for righteousness. So based on these verses, they'll tell you that that means that we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and that our works can't save us. Then they'll go to take you to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, and I don't think, 8 and 9, I don't think they even pulled those up in 10, but we talked about it last week. It says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. That's absolutely true. It is a gift of God. It is grace. It does require grace, and we want to talk about that a little bit more tonight. But it's not grace alone through faith alone, and there is a difference. It goes on to say, not of works lest any man should boast. Now, what is it that Paul is really trying to say with all this? Let me point out that, let's go back to Romans. Paul is speaking to Jews who are still trying to figure out, okay, so now I'm saved as a Christian, but my whole life I have been in this Judaic, Mosaic law, and I, the Pharisees have told me I've got to obey every jot and every tittle of the law, and every part of this mosaic law is a requirement and so now they're coming into the church and there's even controversy to the point that there's a if you read Acts chapter 15 there's a big conference of the church and they're trying to figure out what is it that these Gentiles are supposed to do and are they supposed to obey the law of Moses and at that point there was a determination no they don't have to obey all the law of Moses there are some things the ceremonial law that's that's done away with you know the the things that have been fulfilled in Christ that's done away with but there's still some moral laws and there's there's still some good and we as Christians we need to apply that still within our lives and so the apostle Paul he's going and he's he's starting new churches everywhere he goes to to Galatia and he starts churches and he's going to to the Corinth and he's starting churches and everywhere that he goes when you read read the book of Acts, you realize that the first place he goes, where did he always go when he went to a, a city? He went to the synagogue. He went to the Jews. And he made as many converts as he could there. And a lot of times they rejected this message. And then he said, now I'm going to go to the Gentiles. And so in all of these cities, you find that there's this mix of 
Jews and Gentiles. And so Paul is attempting to still continue to address an issue that it isn't an issue in this day because most of the people that convert that in the United States, most of us are Gentiles. So we don't have this common problem that was a very prevalent problem in the days of the first century church. But it was an issue in Paul's time. And so Paul is continuing to address this. And if you realize the book of Romans, Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11 is a special discourse where Paul is specifically talking about the past condition of the Jews before Calvary, the present condition of where they're at in this age, and what's going to happen after the church age to that chosen people of God and that they are a special people and so he is addressing that and he's addressing this because the Jews are they're, they're very much a part of the church of that day and even Paul is saying in Romans chapter 9 he said, I say the truth in Christ myself also being a witness I wish that I, I could I, I could die for these people that's how much I care about this these are my countrymen and yet at the same time then he goes on to explain things and previously, in Romans chapter 1 through 6, he's talking about you don't have to live according to the Mosaic law. And he's very specific, and he's letting them know that this is not what's taking place. And so, in Romans chapter 4, he's addressing this fact that Jews, there's some things related to the law that we don't have to do. And Gentiles, if you've been told otherwise, you don't have to do this. And so he begins this chapter by saying, what shall we say then that Abraham, our father, who's he talking to? He's talking to the Jews. Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found. What shall we say about Abraham? He goes on to say, for if Abraham were justified by works, he has a reason. He has whereof to glory, but not before God. Abraham, we know him as the father of the faithful. It was the faith of Abraham. And so that, this is what... Uh, Paul is bringing out, he says, for what saith the scripture? And he quotes, he pulls up Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. And he says, Abraham believed God and it was counted or it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And then we go to verse 4 that says, now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. It's very important that what Paul is, we understand what he's talking about, is he's talking about you don't have to depend upon that old law and the works that you were doing within that law. In fact, he, go, he gets very specific. If we go down to verse 9, he says, Cometh this blessedness, this salvation, does it come upon the circumcision only? Now, we know the circumcision, those were definitely the Jews. That was their mark of identity. They, they were circumcised or upon the uncircumcision also. For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. Verse 11 says, and he received the sign of circumcision a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe. Paul is speaking to the entire church, and he's saying all of us have to have faith. And he says that those works of the law that you were doing before, that isn't going to save you. Those are not the critical. Being circumcised isn't what's going to get you saved or get you to heaven. That righteousness might be imputed unto the circumcised and to the uncircumcised. And that he might become the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. He's talking about the faith of Moses, the legalism of the Pharisees. He's saying we don't have to live that way. That's exactly what Paul is referring to in this chapter. If you look at it in context, if you look at all of this, then in, verse, in chapter 5, he begins with, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he goes to Acts chapter, or Romans chapter 6, and he says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in grace that sin may abound? God forbid, all of this is a completion of what he's writing to the church. And what he's saying, it, 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 we've, we've talked about that previously. And he, it's, he, he applies the death, the burial, and the resurrection to repentance and to baptism in the name of Jesus and to walking in newness of life and receiving the Holy Ghost. It is an application of all of that. 
Paul addresses this same issue with the church in Galatians. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 16, he says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. And that's what he's talking about in both Romans 4, 3 and Galatians 3, 6. He even quotes Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. And he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. But in both instances, he wasn't... He was referring to justification that was based upon the Mosaic law. That's exactly what he's addressing with these people. And I think it's important that we understand that because Protestant reformists will take these scriptures to support Martin Luther's unbiblical belief of by grace alone, through faith alone. And that's where a lot of times this attack is levied at us teaching that salvation you must believe in salvation by works because look you do works you know you expect somebody to repent you expect somebody to actually get wet and get baptized and you expect someone to actually speak in tongues that sounds to me like works but What's the true dynamic and instruction in the scriptures between faith and works? Because I just read Romans chapter 4, but my text was James chapter 2. And it seems like there's almost a diametric difference that's so extreme that, you know, you, you have to really know what these scriptures mean or else you're going to accept one and reject the other. And if you talk to a Lutheran and a, and a reformist, they are going to, they'll, they'll focus on Romans and they're going to look at James, and when you start talking about James, they don't even have an answer for you. Martin Luther was the same way. Martin Luther felt like James missed it. He felt like the apostle James was out of the will of God in his writings. Yeah, I'm not just saying that. You can Google it. Don't Google it right now. But you can actually Google it, everything that I'm telling you about Martin Luther, and it's, it's out there. He, he said that the book of James must be counterfeit. Because it contradicted his beliefs. He was saying, you know, this apostle that walked with Jesus and talked with Jesus and, and heard all, all this firsthand from Jesus, his teachings must be wrong because it disagreed with what he, as Martin Luther, saw and felt was really the gist of the gospel. He actually felt like the book of James should be removed from the Bible. And again, you can Google it. I'm not making it up. That's what that, that's and this is the foundation of this man that the Protestant Reformation is built upon. The first person to ever talk about this only needing faith in order to be believe was Martin Luther. And then you have others that follow up in the similar vein of thought. It's, it's only been around it, it, for us. It seems like forever 500 years. But you compare that to the time since the gospel began 2,000 years ago. This is a Johnny-come-lately belief. Well, thankfully, in spite of what Martin Luther said, the book of James, it's still a part of the scriptures. I still believe that it is the inspired word of God. I still believe that scripture doesn't contradict another scripture. And we just need to know how to rightly divide the word of truth. I want to kind of help us with that, if that's all right, for the next few minutes. The key difference between the apostolic church and Martin Luther and his followers is the definition of faith. You talk about the, the, those that are following in this belief, they teach you that if you believe with your heart, you're saved, right? They believe that you know, if you cling to, if you're readily accept, if you hold fast to this belief in Jesus Christ, if you accept Christ as your Savior, if you believe in him, if you believe in the gospel, if you have a mental belief that this is true, that's what faith is. Well, you may not fully understand this, but we as apostolics believe that that's partial faith. I know we don't always talk about it, but I believe that there is a perfected faith that James talked about as well, or a complete faith. And in James chapter 2, verse 22, he says, Seeing thou, thou how faith wrought with his works, and, was, and, works was, and by works was faith made perfect. Faith wrought with his works. Word rot. 
That's a word we don't use a lot. You go to the Greek, and it's the word synergio. It means to work together. It means to be partner in labor. If you go to this word, this is where we get the term synergy. Anybody hear the common term? A lot of times we use it as far as if you can combine two things, and the sum total of the two is, is greater than what you had just from the two individuals, and that's synergy. And this is that synergy that Paul is describing that when it works works with faith, then the sum total is greater than what we actually would have if we just had the works or if we just had that belief without the works. He's saying that it takes both of them to get this perfected, this powerful faith that really is the faith of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the word perfect in the Greek is the word teleo. It means to bring to an end, to complete, to perfect as a course, to carry through completely, clear to the end. And James is saying that it's our obedient response of works. He's not talking about the works of the law, but he's talking about our obedient response to works. And the Bible does talk about obedience to the faith. And that's what we're talking about here tonight is that obedience to the faith. Yet it completes or it allows us to carry through to completion the work of faith in our lives. And the word teleo is, we think of it with a telescope. I haven't seen them a lot recently, but anybody, when you were growing up, do you have one of those little telescopes? And it's like it was small, and then you kind of turned something, and you kind of like extended it, and it was all these little pieces that, anybody remember those telescopes? Yeah, I don't know, if, but you would do it, and it, when it was all closed up, you couldn't see too much. But then once it was fully extended, and once it had expanded, it was, you, you saw things differently, and... It extended and it extended and it extended until it telescoped. And so there's a part that we're involved in with the works. And then there's a part that extends and extends and extends until there's a final consummation. And so James is describing this synergy between faith and works. And the final conclusion extends from the two parts of that, of the mental faith and from the actions of obedience but when you put it all together you get perfected faith or complete faith and this faith is a process this faith faith is it's not a one time time thing that you do it and it's done but it, it's a it's a process and all through the bible it speaks of faith i mean we're not completely saved until we reach heaven we got to reach the streets of gold You're saved when you get the new birth experience. And if you, if you walk in the light and if you stay and that stays, in, we're, we're going to get to heaven. And I believe that and it's the most amazing thing. And we have this earnest of our inheritance. But the Bible doesn't teach that once saved, always saved. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how smart you are. It doesn't matter how long you've been in this. It doesn't matter what you've done. You've got to endure to the end. The Bible says that it's for those that endure to the end. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, you can even be a preacher, I myself should be a castaway. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1 says, Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. He didn't say you should just let it slip a little bit. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, verse 3 says, How shall we escape? If we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. I don't want to neglect this great salvation. I want to make sure that my calling and my election is sure. We walk by faith. It's a walk. And we fight the good fight of faith. And we extend into the very end. And I, don't, I believe that each and every one of us are looking for that day when we hear him say, well done, 
thou good and faithful. Good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. So how does this apply to our obedience to the gospel, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Man, I, I take too long on this stuff. I'm going to do this as quick, quick as I can. Is that all right? Hit it as fast. When we repent, the grace of God draws us and it works through faith. The grace of God draws you and you feel that conviction. And it's only because of the goodness of God that you feel that. But it isn't you. Jesus said no man comes to the Father except the Spirit draw him. So repentance isn't just something that I do on my own. But because of the grace of God, because of the mercy of God, because of the goodness of God, there's a drawing and that drawing is the grace of God. And we do have to have a a response to that grace. We do need to be obedient to that. 1 John 1, verse 9. And this applies not only to the first time that you repent, but every time. Because this is written in the epistles to the church. And he says, if we confess our sins, that's what we do. God, I'm sorry. I'm wrong. That's what we do. That is our work of obedience. If we confess our sins, we've done all that we can. That's the best that I can do. Did it do any good? Not without the work of God. But if he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Who forgives my sins? I don't forgive my sins. God forgives my sins. I don't cleanse myself from all unrighteousness. He cleanses me from all unrighteousness. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that is washing my sins. And I'm purified because of what he's done, not because of what I've done. That's not salvation by works. Oh, no, it's not of works lest any man should boast. I can't boast because I can confess my sins. I have to boast in the one that it's his blood and it's his power. That's what repentance is all about. It's not my works, but it's his works that I'm glorying in notice that our effort is confession and our works don't save us but it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance and our faith is made perfect by God's work baptism is also necessary it's a part of our new birth experience I wish I had more time to cover this I really do John chapter 3 verse 16 you all know it it's probably one of the most you you can go to a ball game and they'll put this up on, on the screen right for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son man I wish I had more time to tear in we're gonna go into this another time that whosoever believes there's that faith there's that definition what's it mean to believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life Man, they're going to tell you that's all you have to do is believe. Did you realize this is a dialogue that starts in John chapter 3, verse 1, and runs through John chapter 3, verse 22? Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. And Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night. And the first thing Jesus says is, Verily, verily, I send to thee, you must be born again. And Nicodemus doesn't understand it. So in verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I send to thee, except a man be born of water. That's baptism. And of the Spirit, that's the Holy Ghost, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Amen. Now, you've got to be born of the water. You've got to be born of the Spirit. But it's not our works that saves us. God does it. God raises us from the dead. He didn't raise us from the dead by himself. He just obeyed the com- we just obeyed the command of Jesus. That's all we're really doing. When we're baptized... It's more than just getting wet. Paul said in Titus chapter 3, verse 5, not by works of righteousness which we have done. Is that exactly what I've been saying all, all night? Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. How? By the washing of regeneration, that's baptism, and the renewing of of the Holy Ghost. When did the washing of regeneration take place? When you're baptized. And Paul described this in, or Peter describes it in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now. That's what the Bible says. Doesn't matter if the Baptists say it's not necessary. The like figure whereunto baptism doth also now save us oh it's not because you get wet it's not whether you use soap or not not the putting away of the filth of the flesh but it's the answer of a good conscience toward god 
And it's by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the power that's in that baptism. Oh, we're baptized and the water isn't holy water. We're baptized and it isn't a special person that baptizes you. I'm honored that I get to baptize somebody, but Paul said it's not Apollos and it's not, you know, Paul. It's, it's, it's really, it's the name that's applied and it's the faith that's applied. But it's more than just getting wet or taking a physical bath because God takes our work of obedience and he completes the work by the washing of regeneration so that we get into that tub, creek, wherever we're at, we're immersed in the name of Jesus. That isn't what saves me. No, but it's the application of that name, and it's the application of that blood, and it's the obedience to the word of God that saves me. What about receiving the Holy Ghost? I have to speak. I have to magnify God and worship God. No. But it's the Spirit that gives the utterance. No one else can give anybody else the Holy Ghost. You can't give yourself the Holy Ghost. You can't say, well, I want it, so I'm just going to get it. You're going to have to worship God, and it's a gift of God. So the works of obedience and repentance, baptism, and receiving the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues are perfected when God in his grace responds to our perfected faith. Our faith of believing and obeying the gospel. And that's how faith is perfected in our lives. And it isn't our works that saves us. We can't be good enough. We can never do enough penance. We can never say enough prayers. We can never read enough of the Bible. We can't be good enough on our own. But it's his grace. And with the work of faith, it comes. There's a completion in our life, and we're allowed not only a new birth, but a new life and a hope for an eternity with Jesus Christ as well. In conclusion, I'm going to read what I told you was my long text, and if the praise singers want to go ahead and come at this time, and we'll go from there. James 2.14 says, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say, though a man say he hath faith, and have not works. And then he asks a question. Can faith. Save him. If you would allow me to edit that. Can faith alone. Save him. If a brother or sister be naked. And destitute of daily food. And one of you say. One of you say unto them, depart in peace, be you warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body. Does it do them any good? Even so, faith, if it hath not works. That's not the works of the law. That's the works of obedience to the word of God. It's dead being alone. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works. Demonstrate it to me. And I will show you my faith by my works. And then he said, you believe that there's one God. And that's good. But what you have is a devil's faith. You have as much faith as a devil. That's what he said. He didn't have to put that there. But he was trying to make a strong point there. I'm not trying to offend anybody. If somebody catches this on YouTube or something, I'm speaking this in full love. But I want to have more faith than a devil. And I want you to have more faith than a devil. He goes on to say, but wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead. It sounds like he's saying it again. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought? We know what that means now, right? The synergy with his works and by works was faith made perfect and complete. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith Abraham believed God. Same scripture that Paul used in Romans. And it was imputed unto him for righteousness and he was called. The friend of God. I don't know about you, but I want to be the friend of God.
I want him to call me friend. He said, those that obey his commandments are those that are going to be his friends. And he goes on to say, you see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. I hope tonight that we can say, I see how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. And then just to make sure that we don't think this is just for the righteous and those that have it all figured out. He goes ahead and gives us another example. He pulls up a, a Gentile. And he pulls up a woman that would have been had less respect in that age and in that time. And then he just goes about it just about as far as you go. And even in our society today, he says it's not just a woman and it's not just a Gentile, but she's a harlot. And just in case you're not sure, the Bible calls her a harlot. And he says, likewise also was not Rahab the harlot. I want you to remember that this woman, because of her faith, is of the lineage of Jesus Christ. And she has a hope, and she, her, her, her seed is a part of what is taking place in the life of the man, Christ Jesus. Likewise, it was also not Rahab the harlot justified by works. You know what that means? I can be saved. It doesn't take just the righteous, but I, I, God's, if I just have an obedience to the faith, then I can be saved as well. When she had received the messages and sent them out another way, and he concludes this chapter with this words, for as the body without the spirit is dead. Y'all know what he's talking about. It's a corpse. It's done with. There's no, no life, no hope. He said that's the way faith is without works. There's nothing to it. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful today for the grace of God. The grace of God that bring us salvation. It's not by my works. Why don't you go ahead and stand? We're getting ready to sing. I'm thankful for a new birth that he's given to us, and he's given it to us. I'm thankful today that he's given us a plan and a purpose and that he asks us to be obedient, but it's the obedience that in turn allows us to know his mercy and his grace. And, you know, I know that it took the sinless life and the cruel death of Calvary. And it is by his grace. And I never want to forget or take any, anything for granted related to the blood of Jesus Christ. But I don't want to take it for granted in that I think that I can save myself. But I don't want to take it for granted in thinking that I don't have to apply it. And I don't have to be obedient to it. And I don't have to, to live in obedience to it. But I want to know that I found the grace of God. That bring us salvation, and it's in my heart, and it's in my life. And Paul said, the grace of God that bring us salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. And then he said, looking for that glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We're going to sing. I hope we can sing a song of thanksgiving. But whatever we do, why don't you just lift your hands and just begin to thank him for that great grace. God, I thank you for your mercy. God, I thank you for your love. God, I thank you for the beautiful relationship that you, God, have paid the price that I can't pay. God, that it is your reaching, that it is your mercy. God, that it's by grace through faith that we're saved. Not of words.